एंड फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू अनदर एक्साइटिंग एपिसोड ऑफ ईवा टॉक बाय टेन टाइम्स आई एम योर होस्ट राधिका एंड टुडे वी हैव अ फैसिनेटिंग टॉपिक एंड स्पीकर ऑन द एजेंडा मैनेजिंग पार्टिसिपेंट इंगेजमेंट इन वर्चुअल एंड हाइब्रिड इवेंट्स टू डेल डीपर एज आई सेड इन टू दिस टॉपिक वी आर थ्रिल टू हैव एलायस पुरूने विद अस टुडे एलायस इज द फाउंडर ऑफ ट्रैक्टिस इवेंट्स where he helps event specialists create memorable profitable hybrid and online conference and trade shows welcome to the show elias thank you so much for having me appreciate being here that's great so elias just before we start i'd like to hear something more about you sure so i mean you probably might be wondering how did i get into this industry i started by doing audiovisual in high school and kind of stuck with it became a trained mm-hmm. computer scientist written a lot of code uh mm-hmm. wrote my own event platform at one point during the middle of the pandemic of course when everybody else was doing it it was cool yeah and then started to get more phone calls for how to do uh, how to transition to hybrid events uh uh-huh. got those calls from places of worship and one thing led to another and here we are we're doing virtual and hybrid event production and it's 2024 <laughs> yes uh that's great great and thank you for the introduction so um elias just to start with um you know what are some of the innovative strategies that you would say that uh you know while we talk about hybrid and virtual events that uh, you know keeps the participants engaged throughout what do you feel about it so i find that there's a lot of temptation to look for the tools mm-hmm. the magic button that makes people go and be engaged. And mm-hmm. I've had that on a number of discovery calls like is there a platform is there a tool is there something that we can use to up our engagement and make people more excited. And they're really just looking for a magic button. Okay. But I find that over time the fundamentals of what makes a event or what makes a session engaging don't change all that much. Mhm. The what I'm noticing is not working anymore. I'll start with that. Mm-hmm. what isn't working anymore is just sitting down for and getting attendees to all sit down for an hour in front of their screens or in front of a stage and listen mm-hmm. to somebody talk for 59.5 minutes yeah. and then have the moderator turn around and say mm i don't think we have time for questions it's time for break thank you so much mr yeah. speaker for being up here that's mm-hmm. not working because that's mm-hmm. not engaging that's just a you're back at a college lecture right yeah there's there's no back and forth exactly what i find is working is when you do have that back and forth one of the best sessions we ever did the speaker thought he only had 30 minutes he trimmed his mm-hmm. session down to 20 minutes we get to that end of the 20 minutes we actually ended up going overtime with questions and oh. with going into more detail uh-huh. so that what i find strategy wise when you are designing content or you are designing experiences because that's what we're doing in the virtual and the in person realm is mm-hmm. to really reconsider the role of your traditional content. Like mm-hmm. do you need to have a 1 hour session? I understand mm-hmm. some organizations, yeah, you need to have a 1 hour session because continuing education regulations. I get that. Yeah. But do all your sessions need to be 1 hour? Do they mm-hmm. need to be the traditional we stand up, deliver a lecture style talk for 40 minutes and then open it up to a couple of questions from the floor? Mm-hmm. Can you provide some of that content ahead of time? can you shorten down and have lightning talks like 5 10 mm-hmm. minutes leave lots of time for questions can for in person and hybrid events can you leave lots of time for networking that's the sort you have to really think about the way that you're delivering your content if you want to come up with good strategies around keeping people engaged mm-hmm. keeping people engaged is really about how in if you want to, another way to think about keeping people engaged is mm-hmm. how can we retain their attention for the longest yeah because there's a lot of competition for people's attention and a, some of the strategies for doing that they're super low tech leaving lots okay. of time for questions having good prepared speakers mm-hmm. like, that's that's some of the easiest ways to get people engaged all right all right i do agree i do agree here that you know keeping the audience engaged not just in a form of i would say monologue that you just deliver what you want and then you move but interaction networking you know landing those conversations somewhere is definitely the key to uh, engagement 
So uh, I suppose that's like an old school strategy that we've been applying always and that works for both kind of setups now too. So mm-hmm. um, Elias, if we move ahead, uh, you know, what are what would you say about the role that uh, tech plays in enhancing participant engagement and virtual and hybrid events as we are talking about? I love this question. I'm so excited <laughs> for this one. Yeah. Boy, howdy, have I got some thoughts on this one. So let's talk about hybrid and let's talk about in-person and then we'll talk about mm-hmm. virtual. Because in my past, before I started doing virtual and hybrid production, mm-hmm. for a number of years, I was making and marketing an event app. Okay. And one of the biggest struggles I had with finding product market fit for this is I, when I originally came up with the app, I said, oh, People are looking at their phones while they're at an event. Let's give them something to look at. Let's give them Mm -hmm. a way to plan their event. Let's give them a way to network. Let's give them a way to do this, that, and the other thing. And so I made an event app. What I got wrong, and I think this is where a lot of tech solutions that try to enhance events get wrong, is they make this assumption that an attendee is going to be on their app at the mm-hmm. conference or at the event at all times. And that's just not yeah, the case. That's not the case, yeah. It's not the case at all. Mm-hmm. Where the app comes in handy is uh-huh. before the event. Yes. It is how I can see who's on the trade show floor, who, where, are, I, I'm, I think about my last experience with going to National Association of Broadcasters, NAB. Mm-hmm. I use the app a lot to plan mm-hmm. out where I was going. Yeah. But by, the, but by the time I hit the show floor, I only used the app a, maybe a handful of times to just mm. find my way around the floor. I wasn't doing any networking inside the app. Yeah, I was doing yeah. all of that inside channel conversations. Mm-hmm. And when I look mm-hmm. at our usage metrics on our old app, yeah. it was the same thing. Mm-hmm. And so if you are relying on your technology and saying and kind of waiting to the last minute to release that app, And Mm -hmm. not giving people guidelines as to how to use this technology to really enhance your Mm -hmm. experience, then you're doing your audience a huge disservice. Mm -hmm. You actually, I, my belief is that the amount, if you're in person, the amount of technology Mm -hmm. that you should be interacting with on Mm -hmm. to plan out your stay while you're there should Mm -hmm. be close to zero. Like you should just be referencing your phone. It's just a replacement for paper. Okay. Now, okay. when it comes to bridging those two worlds, you know, how do you bridge the virtual and the hybrid world? That's an open area of conversation that we're still working on. Mm-hmm. And I would, I've seen it and we've tried to do it on a number of different occasions. Mm-hmm. And the biggest thing I've found is that a lot of tech solutions that bridge those two worlds, they kind of demo well. And we're starting okay. to see stuff like the portal between what is it, New York and Germany, I think. Mm-hmm. Like there's that there's that video portal that's opened up and it closed for salacious things and then it opened up again. Um, yeah, that's okay. again that stuff. I find it demos well, but aside from maybe capturing somebody's attention for a few minutes, mm-hmm. the bigger question is: Is this adding to the experience? Is this making this event memorable? And if mm-hmm. it is, then great, keep it. Yeah, but don't don't rely on just the technology or. Uh, don't rely on just the technology to at uh, let me try this one last time okay. the technology is not going to magically unlock engagement okay it is yeah. not your it's not the silver bullet for engagement it has to be meaningful yeah so yeah. Whatever said, you, yeah. yeah whatever you decide to do whether it's holograms whether it's those portals whether it's uh, uh, avatars whatever it might mm-hmm. be it needs to be meaningful. It needs to contribute to the experience in some way. Yeah, yeah. Resulting into something. Exactly. Something new. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I totally agree. Yes. That's probably one thing that we uh, can learn from, you know, that uh, it could help, yes, navigate. Yes, let, let us probably record things that, you know, people are taking pictures and posting it there so that, yes, people are socializing through the social network. But yes, the essence of networking on event physically is definitely something, uh, you know, works. One other thing about the technology, though, is with the rise of AI and as it gets better and better, what we're starting to see is events, both virtual and physical, become more accessible. 
I, I had a recent uh, live stream we were doing. This was for a house of worship. And we mm -hmm. had an individual, this person had, was uh, deaf, so mm -hmm. zero hearing, uh, mm -hmm. was, had limited verbal communication ability okay. and was, I believe, dyslexic as well. So it was, okay. it was challenging to communicate with this individual. Yeah. What we were able to do, though, was because we were live streaming the event, we were able to get it loaded on his phone on Zoom, mm -hmm. turn on closed captioning, and he was able to appreciate the event that was going on. He was able to be a part of it, ju not, okay. just, not just on an online space, but in a physical space as well. And mm -hmm. we're starting to see now with technology, with AI getting better, we're starting to see real-time translations that don't read like a ransom note. Like they're actually yeah. good. They're actually good translations. You know, a exactly. native speaker of another language mm -hmm. would be mm -hmm. able to not just follow along, but actually appreciate the content. So yes. we're seeing, so where technology can increase the participant engagement is we can now say, you know what? We can offer our mainstream in, you know, two or three other target demographic languages. Yeah. So now yeah. we've just increased our audience size mm -hmm. without adding much additional cost. Yes. Yes. True. Quite true. Very great idea. Yes. And uh, any more points that we have from Elias on this? I think the biggest one for me is in terms of engagement is that, it, oh, you know what the other part of the technology side is? Again, going mm -hmm. back to live streams, this was a bit of a surprise to us, but then it made total sense when we saw this because we had, so last year we were running a hybrid. And uh -huh. it, as part of this hybrid event, we were, uh, obviously we were live streaming, but we were capturing which people were in the room, both physical and virtual, because we needed to report that for continuing education credits for okay. our clients. What I noticed was there was a there were a couple individuals that when I pulled their education report, they showed up both on the virtual side and on the in-person side. And the only way okay. that we have an in-person side is if we have a physical badge scan. Okay. And so okay. I was going, well, wait a second here. Why do we have, why were they attending the online session and the in-person session at the same time. Yeah. Yes, you know what, exactly. Yeah. You know what they were doing? Yeah. They were listening to the live feed because they were at the, what we realized was they were at this person. I knew the, who the person was. This person would, was, you know, they were going between meetings and then they would get to the session a little bit late. Okay. They were sitting at the back of the room and because we were streaming in real time, they could put on headphones and hear the and hear the presenter better than through the in-room sound system. That could be one of the pros too. Yes, yeah. of course. So now, mm -hmm. so now they were able to have. So here's where we tie it back into the engagement side. If you're streaming in real time at a virtual or hybrid event, we now have basically personal amplification systems that you can put on. We yeah. used to have to pay good money for a telex system or something else and, yeah. and hand out those headsets. And we only had a limited number of them. Yeah. As long as you've got decent Wi-Fi and you're streaming out in real time, yeah. you can just say to people, throw on your headphones. Yeah, exactly. That's one so, of the pros. Of course, I do agree here. So, so that that's, a, that's a huge one. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, it does help. So, of course, just like any other aspect, uh, you know, it has both pros and cons. And as you mentioned that, yes, engagement could be hampered, but uh, there are also the pros in terms of, uh, you know, I would say development uh, in the world of events that, you know, you can uh, connect to more people, or uh, as you mentioned, the physically challenged people then it could also be that, you know, uh, we can connect in the same event and replaying the same also could also be one of the cases where, you know, people are coming back, maybe they've attended some other thing, they also want to look at what's happening here. So all of those aspects, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, so um, what do you think some of the best practices for uh, incorporating interactive elements such as, uh, you know, polls, uh, Q&A sessions, network you know, networking opportunities, I would say, and uh, into, of course, uh, virtual and hybrid events to uh, 
most part is with engagement. I'll start by saying that if you're, again, if you're just delivering a straight lecture or monologue style talk, mm -hmm. at this point is 2024, make it a YouTube video and just make it accessible mm -hmm. because nobody wants to sit through a 60 minute lecture. Yeah. The interactivity, True. again, it comes, I go back to, it can be as simple as, you know, put a, put your hand in the, put your hand up in the chat, you know, mm -hmm. give me a reaction. What is your experience like? Uh, mm -hmm. I've sat in on a number of uh, Julius Solaris's sessions that he'll do through Bold Push. And mm -hmm. he refers to, I love this idea. He refers to the chat as the remote control for the session. Mm -hmm. This is how he, he uses that chat to take the temperature of the room, see what's on everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. Even just as simple when you're talking about virtual and hybrid, mm -hmm. even just as simple as saying, you know, what is your experience like in this topic mm -hmm. and having people write stuff down in the chat, because mm -hmm. you might have you as a speaker, you might have an idea of the session going one way. I mean, when we came into this session, I had an idea of it going one way and now we're mm -hmm. exploring other tangents as we go. So mm -hmm. you as a speaker, using just that tool, taking the temperature yeah. of the room, using the live chat, both for the mm -hmm. in-person and the online people. Mm -hmm. And this, this, is a big, this is a big opportunity I think that, that uh, planners miss sometimes is they go, well, we'll do questions from the in-person audience through microphones and the online audience will just do through text. Yeah. And okay. we've actually had a lot more success if we do all questions through text. Mm -hmm. It, for the in-person side, it prevents somebody from hogging the microphone and just giving their unsolicited yeah. opinion on something yeah. rather than asking a question. Yeah. I also know that because I've been that person. <laughs> By the way, pro tip, if you don't want people to do that, do not yeah. hand them the microphone. Okay. Never hand, oh. a part, never hand an attendee the microphone. They will take it and they will run with it. And yeah. it is kind of painful to get back. If you're holding the microphone, they'll get the idea that I need to actually be succinct and uh, get to the point. Yeah. So, but doing the, if you, if you take all the questions or all the comments through text, even for, for in-person and online, it does force people to get concise and it yeah. does. And if you allow anonymous questions as well, you can get those spicy takes or those harder to address questions that the, that attendees really want the answers to, mm -hmm. but it does require that your whoever your panel is or whoever your presenter is, it does require that they have some confidence and they're okay with, you're going to get a hardball question here. Yeah. You know, you're going to yeah. get a curveball. You're going to get something potentially. And I understand that there are some companies and there are some clients that they don't want to take that because maybe this is a publicly available presentation. You know, maybe you're a publicly traded company, you've got the CEO and yeah. this is a public session. Yeah. The mm -hmm. questions have to be curated. I get that. But mm -hmm if it is possible to take those questions by text and allow anonymous questions to be submitted mm -hmm. and you're willing to, you know, I, I remember last year we had a session where we had somebody from, it was a speaker and he was from the United Nations and we got, mm -hmm. and I remember having to ask, it was a, I forget the exact question. I remember it was a very politically charged question. It was a good question from the audience member. It wasn't just a throwaway. And I read the question and I just hear from the audience, ooh. <laughs> and, I was, and I remember thinking, like, nobody, whoever asked this question, and it came in as an anonymous question. I remember thinking, yeah. this would have never, this is a really good question. It's controversial, but it's a good yes. question. And it would have never gotten asked mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. had we just had a microphone going around the room. <laughs> it would have never gotten asked. So that's the simplest way. Text yeah. questions. Use the mm -hmm. chat, use the live mm -hmm. chat as taking the temperature of the room. Mm -hmm. Polls can be good for just getting, you know, a quick snapshot of how people are yeah. feeling. Uh, if you're doing virtual, we use polls a lot. Uh, Zoom has a new feature where you can use polls to actually assign people to breakout rooms. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I was working with another client and we used that actually to come up with, we said, okay, we're going to host a networking event on Zoom. And yeah, you can do networking mm -hmm. events on Zoom and they're mm -hmm. fantastic low cost way to get people together. What we did was said, okay, we've got six subject matter experts, mm -hmm. choose which room you want to go to first. Mm -hmm. and so we popped up that poll, people responded to where they wanted to go. And then we, if you didn't respond, just stayed in the main room and you just hung out with us hosts. Yeah. And, and, and we gave people the ability to go around different breakout rooms. If they wanted to switch sessions and they had 
I mean, the first time they did it, the first time this client did it, they had so much demand and success for it that it's now a regular part of their of their uh, content schedule. Like they do yeah. them every, they do them at least once every two months. And this is a community that does, you know, they'll have six to eight weekly calls. And they're mm -hmm. on top of that, they're putting in networking events now. On That's Zoom. impressive. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you can run networking events on Zoom. They can run quite well. Yeah. Uh, even on floor where we are recording right now, we have like a feature, you know, you can run polls and, uh, you know, you can have Q&As and all those interactive little features to keep the engagement on. So, yeah, uh, I think it's a great way to interact. And yes, of course, keep the, uh, you know, audience alive, I would say, because there are some topics that people won't be, you know, so much interested in. And then you have these questions. So, of course, that brings back the, uh, you know, chat, I would say. So, yeah. Um, Elias, before, uh, you know, I strike the next question, anything, any uh, final notes on probably, you know, any of the interactive elements that you have found new uh, that has probably helped uh, apart from those polls and Q&As? I mean, polls and Q&A, they're fine. Live chat is just, it's evergreen. I mean, you see yeah. people posting threads. Being able, I mean, bringing that into the live feed as well. We've got a client we're working with. We're bringing in their, in the comments they get from social media. We bring that into our live feed and we throw those questions up. People love to see their questions being yeah. answered. They yeah. love to see their name on the screen, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's, it, you know, it, it doesn't have to, you don't need to use every single bell and whistle. And again, you have to think about, is this a meaningful use of the technology? Yeah. Do we need to do a poll? Do we need to do... Uh, you know, it's separate area for Q&A. Can we just use mm -hmm. the chat for everything? Everybody just keeps coming back to the text chat. It's one of the most accessible ways to kind of level the playing field for everybody and get that interaction and take yeah. the temperature of the room. What's on everybody's <laughs> mind? Yes, yes, totally agree, totally agree. Uh, so with this, uh, you know, I have another question. So how can event planners probably strike a balance between structured content delivery and spontaneous participant interaction? And of course, the both kind of event formats. So this is going to be controversial. <laughs> because, <All right. laughs> because I'm going to say something that a lot of event planners aren't going to like. Uh -huh. And that is, I think at this point, uh -huh. if you are planning any kind of event mm -hmm. and you're and you're going to do content first you're going to load mm -hmm. the schedule up with 100 sessions we're going to have parallel tracks and lots of breakouts mm -hmm. and there's mm -hmm. going to be 15 minutes between sessions where you can do networking mm -hmm. they're not doing networking you're going to the bathroom between sessions because everybody's got to go to the bathroom between sessions and get a mm -hmm. coffee mm -hmm. okay. you're not going to feel the impact of that kind of a schedule in your mm -hmm. 2024 maybe even your 2025 event where you're going to see it is mm -hmm. in 2025 and 2026 and beyond. Mm -hmm. That format, I think, has been on its way out for a while. Mm -hmm. And it's only accelerated. Okay. If I okay. forget who said it, but it's a fantastic quote, which is, if you can do it on Zoom, don't do it mm -hmm. in the room. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. Let's, right? Okay. Let's and so here is my belief after producing many hybrid events, I produced mm -hmm. in-person events, I produced virtual events, I produced hybrid events. Mm -hmm. And the commonality that I'm seeing between all of those mm -hmm. is that for content, virtual mm -hmm. is king. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. It is no longer, if you are going to be delivering any content in person, Mm -hmm. You limit, you need to put an emphasis on interactivity mm -hmm. and quality. Okay. People okay. will attend an in-person mm -hmm. session. For example, they will attend an A-level panel mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. they've got the chance to ask the tough questions. Yes. If they've got, you know, it, you need, you need to have a A-level panel. When I'm talking A-level panel, I'm talking about the VIPs in your industry not celebrities mm -hmm. by the mm -hmm. way people are not going for celebrities anymore that's yeah, just, yeah. That's not. i get it i'm, I'm talking about your the VIPs. one with the right knowledge you would exactly say. the ones yeah. the ones with the actual 
you know, good knowledge that would be in a, and who are willing to answer the tough questions. Totally. That's mm-hmm. the sort of stuff that will get butts in seats. I I saw that I was producing a one day mastermind in Tampa last mm-hmm. year, and we saw that they had, we had I think two prepared sessions. Those prepared mm-hmm. sessions, though, it was about maybe 30 minutes of content and 60 minutes of questions. And it didn't shy away from any of the questions either. Mm-hmm. Then the rest of it was we had an opening keynote, which was opening keynote, which was great. We had a really dynamic speaker. And then the rest of the sessions were all A-level panels with some of the best in the industry. And they would talk for maybe 10, 15 minutes, and they took questions for the remaining hour. And it was it was it was chock full of it was chock full mm-hmm. of actionable ideas. Mm-hmm. So between structured content, if we're talking about structured content delivery, if we're talking mm-hmm. about just straight content delivery, at mm-hmm. this point, do it online. Mm-hmm. Doing it okay. in person. Like imagine if you and I, this content that we, you and I are making right now, we would not be able to do this at a cost-effective way if we had to do it in person. Yeah. Like, just think about the logistics here. We'd have to go rent cameras, microphones, find a venue. We'd have to book flights. We'd have to do all that. Like, we'd probably be at least 10 grand out of pocket each before yeah. we'd even get a 30 minute conversation recorded. Yes. But because of the internet, exactly. what's, our fix, what's our fixed cost for an internet connection? You know, I buy my camera and set up once, and now I yeah. can be on as many events as I want to be, and I can have that yeah. high quality audio. Like you make that investment once and I'm seeing this trend into, you know, I'm working with other clients that they will, they're building out studios because Mm -hmm. they realize that, hey, we spend this once instead of renting a venue every single time and trucking in all the audiovisual gear to make our content and deliver our event. We can do Mm -hmm. this online. And then it's exactly what my one client is doing. They're delivering their content online. And then they have an executive masterclass series or an executive retreat where it's like a one or two day event in person, all about the networking. It is all about the A-level panels. Like they have one or two panels max. People that you just, you know, you cannot get access to. So in terms of, in terms of striking that balance, I think, I think conferences and trade shows that are going to really rock it in the next few years Mm -hmm. are going to be the ones where we say, you know what, we're going to deliver our content online because that's where we can do it, either mm-hmm. pre-recorded or we'll put up live streams where you can ask mm-hmm. questions and have some interactivity. Mm-hmm. And then the in-person side is all about that stuff that is still hard to replicate online. And we're getting yeah. closer and closer to. But again, it's, it I think we, quite I think, sense. yeah, I think, I think part of it too is also moving beyond the pandemic thinking of, oh, everybody's just going to be sitting at home wearing VR. Yeah. Like, that's like, that was true in 2020 modern day 2024 i that's still not you know i don't think people will want to wear headsets on a regular basis we have the apple vision pro now so that's going to that will be interesting to see how stuff like how tech like that is going to change things i'm curious to see the longer term impact of something like the apple vision pro on our event experience i mean thinking way into the future and this will probably is leading into your last question um, thinking way into the future, I could see a future where if I'm at a networking event and I've got my Apple Vision Pro on or whatever headset mm-hmm. I'm wearing at the time, mm-hmm. if it's seamless enough, I could see walking up to you at a trade show and, oh, there's your LinkedIn, there's your X, yeah. there's your Instagram, okay. there's a little bio about you so that I'm not fumbling. Because yeah. like this, that's replacing the, the traditional event app, right? Where, yeah. you know, scrolling the through and, and, too, and, and, cross, and crossing my fingers that you actually put your information into yeah. your profile, which none of the exhibitors do. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. That's, that's a quite a new side that you just mentioned. And I, I would say that, yes, a lot of people wouldn't agree. Even right now, understanding the whole concept of probably moving into this kind of setup where, you know, uh, structured and spontaneous, both kind of conversations can run in. But yes, limited agency, limited provision is, uh, yes, could be, could be one of the scenarios that can be worked around. So yeah, that's quite a new thought that probably we, or my audience is also going to listen to. Um, uh, That was really nice to hear. Uh, about probably what kind of new ways we can implement uh, our participation along with the interaction in uh, different uh, spontaneous ways. 
Um, if we add on to it, uh, my probably my last question for you is uh, look, just like you talked about the future trends that are going to come, right? So what trends do you anticipate in the realm of, uh, you know, participation for both uh, the virtual and the hybrid events? And I think this is something we are going to hear a good amount of information from uh, Elias. So the future trends. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how that Apple Vision Pro is going to change events. Yeah. Because I don't okay. think version one is going to change mm -hmm. events as we know them today. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason is just that it's version one. But another yeah. part of the reason is I do find as I work more with some planners and mm -hmm. some clients mm -hmm. that there is a hesitancy to change in events. Okay. Change is okay. scary. Mm -hmm. We know, you know, if you if you look at a organization that has done an event for maybe 20 or 30 years or maybe five or 10 years, even, mm -hmm. they generally have done that event because they mm -hmm. have a format that they know works or works well enough. And okay. so there's going to be hesitancy to say, well, let's rock the boat. Let's change things. Yeah. You know, your your agenda has been very content driven for the last 10 years let's flip it on its head and say, we're going to expand the trade show and we're going to shrink the content or put the content online. Mm -hmm. And I find that there's a lot of hesitancy about that because I feel like everybody's waiting for somebody else to go first. Yeah. And that seems to be across the board. So in terms of future trends, I think, I don't know that we're going to need kind of a black swan event like we saw with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I also think that there's there's a lag period between these technologies and between ideas being thought of and tried mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. them becoming mainstream. Mm -hmm. And there's a ton, because like, look, there's a ton of technology out there already for mm -hmm. producing events. There's mm -hmm. a ton of technology out there for doing engagement. I mean, we can rewind the clock and go all the way back to the 1980s and 1990s when we had the literal foundations of virtual event technology out there. I mean, Microsoft mm -hmm. NetMeeting, for example, you know, yeah. nobody remembers that. But mm -hmm. like, yeah. we, we, like the, I, I was just rebuilding a retro computer the other day and I was installing Windows 98 on it. And it was talking mm -hmm. about how you could have virtual meetings with Microsoft yeah. NetMeeting if both sides have a, have a web camera. Yeah. Like they, weren't saying, yeah. And they weren't saying webcam, by the way. They were saying web camera, yeah. right? Yeah. So this stuff has been around for a long time. But the adoption has been slow. Why has it been slow? Because, well, I think predominantly because of cost. And in some cases, there are a lot of event tech solutions out there that are solutions that are in search of a problem. Mm -hmm. so there's, there's, no, there's no end to the amount of technology that is out there. The real question mm -hmm. is, is this actually useful at making our events more engaging? Is it useful at making our events more memorable? Mm -hmm. If the event is engaging, it's going to be memorable. So yeah. in, terms of, in terms of future trends, I think as we're also, there's, there's another trend that's informing this, which is we're seeing costs across the board to host events rise. I mean, mm -hmm. again, I was in Vegas just a couple weeks ago. You know, a donut and a coffee is 15 USD. Yeah. Like it's, so it's expensive on the attendees to travel. It's expensive to host events in person. Even if you're going to a tier three, tier two, or a tier three destination that is cutting mm -hmm. you some deals, it's still not cheap. Yeah. And the value proposition, and the value proposition is becoming more and more of a question mark in person for the mm -hmm. in person side. So mm -hmm. in 21 and 22, we were able to kind of do events the way that we did them and get together because we had been deprived of human contact yeah. for two years. Yeah. So anything yeah. was going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Totally but agree. now the bill is coming in mm -hmm. and we're seeing that, oh, we're spending, you know, $40,000 on internet and $70,000 on AV. And mm -hmm. we haven't even talked about the catering bill and we haven't even talked about the room rental bill. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of expenses that are coming up when it comes to producing events. So mm -hmm. there's two ways that we can go. Either we can say, okay, we got to make the event more expensive or we're just going to tank the cost and keep doing what we've always been doing. But at some point, you're going to start losing money on that. Yeah. And there's no, and there's no real, there's not a real good business case for losing money on your event. 
or we need to say, okay, what can we do that is virtual, that engages people year round, that will okay. maybe lead into a, uh, uh, into a cornerstone event for our community. Mm-hmm. So I think in terms of future trends, we're going to start mm-hmm. to see as much as virtual has kind of been the, you know, it's kind of been the laughing stock for the last year. Mm-hmm. I think we're going to see a big resurgence of it. And we're already starting to see a slow resurgence of more virtual content, more online content. I want to actually get away from the word virtual events. I want to get back. To, I want to call them just online events, online experiences, mm-hmm. because that's because that's what they are. Mm-hmm. They're no less they're no less real in our brains. Yeah. In, in terms of participant engagement for virtual events, I mean, we're seeing YouTubers and streamers and VTubers lead the charge on this. You know, they're mm-hmm. hosting streams. They have gated communities. Um, they, they're they constantly responding to their community. You know, yeah. they're bringing them, you know, they're responding to live to chat. Yeah. Yeah. The, the chat can actually, like, depending on the streamer you're watching, the chat can actually, you know, donate a couple bits. And then all of a sudden, yeah. you know, the, like a, a ball gets thrown at the host. And like it's it's little yeah. things like that, but but we're seeing that start to happen on the fringes now, and I think we're going to mm. start to see those kinds of what we're seeing indie, uh, let's say indie content creators do. I think we're going to start mm. to see that become a little bit more mainstream. And then yeah. when it comes to and then when we talk about in the in person side, what's going to happen there? Again, mm. Apple Vision Pro seems like a bit of a wild card. It's mm. like what does what does that augmented reality do for us? The biggest issue there is going to be, do we have enough data to feed this thing so that we can get something so that the consumer or the participant can get something useful from using the technology? And that's going to be true no matter what tech you use, whether it's an event app or whether you're strapping on a pair of goggles or whether you've got a Neuralink uh, implant. Mm -hmm. It's not going to matter if the data is not available. That's another Mm -hmm. trend I think is going to be is is coming now. Is okay. making sure that you have that you have enough data that you can feed to whatever technology that you're using that can help attendees make the most of their experience. If the data okay. is, if the data is not there, then we can have the flashiest technology in the world can't do anything with it. So I think that's going to be a huge trend. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so. In terms of uh, tech, you would say that, yes, using VR, AR, uh, you know, in, by probably involving all of those factors, along with uh, probably, li- like we talked in our last question, that, you know, uh, probably maintaining the agency for limited audience and also maintaining agency for, you know, uh, interacting with all the audience that is, you know, making it an open platform, right? So uh, these are some things that could be uh, helpful in terms of trends. Um, But is there any specific trend as an example that you must have seen somewhere and that you would like to share with the audience that kept the, uh, you know, interaction on or maybe the chat burning? I mean, the biggest, the number one biggest trend I've seen, and again, I hate to, I feel like this is going to be a bit of a letdown. Mm-hmm. But the number one biggest trend I keep seeing, despite all the new technology, despite all the new trends that we see, despite mm-hmm. everything we have available to us, it is the good old reliable chat that keeps <laughs> being the cornerstone of online and sometimes in-person interaction. Just some okay. of those sidebar conversations that the, that the chat can enable. The chat is just the unsung, in my opinion, is just the unsung hero of Mm -hmm. interactivity in both virtual and in-person events. Mm -hmm. It just is. And being Mm -hmm. able to use that, I think everybody needs to think about this as more than just a general chat. This is your way to take the temperature of the room. This Mm -hmm. is your way to see what is really on attendees' minds. Like, what are they Mm -hmm. actually concerned about? What do they want Mm -hmm. to get out of this session? What are the problems that they're seeing? You know, Mm -hmm. and if you start... Like I will do this in my sessions all the time, you know, type in the chat. What's your big, what's the biggest problem that you're facing? You know, give me a one in the chat. Like literally give me a one in the chat. If you're facing this problem, I've seen so many people do that. And Mm -hmm. it's, and again, it is such a quick way to say, to get your, to get the pulse of the room, to take the temperature of the room. Mm -hmm. It's, and, and it's such a, it costs nothing. Every platform has it. Yeah. I I think though. I think, though, that in-person events are not using the chat nearly as much as they should be. 
I think there is, I think during sessions, there is a huge opportunity to use the live chat mm -hmm. to interact with mm -hmm. not just the online participants, but to be able to give their opinion and, and give their reactions. And I think that needs to be built in to mm -hmm. the way that your conference sessions are structured. I think you need yeah. to, you need to make the chat a first class citizen of your events, mm -hmm. whether in person, mm -hmm. online, hybrid, doesn't matter. Your chat, this is going to be where the real action happens. Yeah. Like we see it on yeah. Slack, we see it on Discord, we see it during live sessions. It's the chat is where it's at. You need to make mm -hmm. it a first class citizen of your events, of your experience. Okay. So I think uh, in the audience, while they hear about it, they should be using the chat, be it via, from the organizer's side or, uh, you know, at the audience's side. Uh, the chat should be running, your thoughts should be running, then you could pro probably pour out your questions, uh, you know, connect with people, uh, drop messages to connect, drop probably the industry you are coming from, what topics you are probably can connect on. So yeah, uh, thank you, Elias. Thank you for sharing all the thoughts. Thank you for sharing, uh, you know, the controversial ones, the pros, the cons. And all of you to, uh, you know, the hybrid and virtual setup of events. Uh, thank you again. And um, uh, thank you for joining Eva Talk. So uh, any final words before we end this chat? I think when you're going and planning your next virtual, your next hybrid, your next in-person event, there is no magic button. There is no magic tool that will just increase your engagement. Mm -hmm. that does if you're looking for just the magic button the magic tool the magic whatever it is silver bullet whatever you want to call it that mm -hmm. kind of thing doesn't exist it is whether you're doing in person online hybrid you need to think about the attendee experience that is key everything else that you choose in your tech stack from mm -hmm. the audio visual to the venue you're choosing to the online platform you decide to use everything will flow naturally from that yeah yeah. You need so to curious. you need to be clear with what you need to be clear with what you want your attendees to walk away with. Mm -hmm. And if that's not clear, no tool in the world's going to help. Mm. That's that's actually a fact. I would say a fact. So, uh, thank you. Thank you again, Elias. And uh, thank you to our listeners for tuning in to this episode of Eva Talk by 10 Times. Today, uh, you know, keep tuned and you'll be having more episodes where we explore the latest trends and insight in the event industry. Thank you, everyone.